Yeah, I'm Jonah from Norfolk Rivers Trust. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I've been invited to talk about something that we've been working on for um, actually probably eight years um, that I feel we're edging closer and closer to. Um, we're looking at um, East Anglia and Fenland and Cameo's great lost fish, the burbot. Um, as far as we know, it's, it's the only freshwater fish species to have, have become extinct in England. Um, and we're looking at the possibility of bringing it back. It's kind of picked up steam a lot in recent years with successful reintroductions of beavers and sea eagles and, <clears throat> and butterflies and things. And it's, it's rapidly over the last probably three years become something that um, really seems quite, quite achievable and um, sensible. So what is a burbot? Um, it's a mostly freshwater uh, fish species. They will use estuarine waters. Um, they'll also use the Baltic and we suspect the North Sea. But um, yeah, they're a, they're a globally widespread freshwater member of the cod family. Nothing else quite like them in, in English rivers at all. It doesn't have any close relatives. Um, I suppose if you think of it as, as being something like an eel, it behaves in, in a lot of ways in its diet and, and behaviour like an eel. Um, and um, yeah, the, they, uh, the freshwater species, um, omnivorous, uh, quite variable in size. We think from the records that we've got from UK fish and looking at continental fish, a big bird, but realistically is probably 30 to 40 centimetres. But if you look at specimens that are caught in, in North America and from under the ice in Finland, they can get pretty huge, um, up, to, up to something like a metre, sort of approaching something like a catfish. We don't think that's realistic for, for what would happen in Norfolk, but that is, that is certainly within their genetic capabilities. So there they are, um, often described as ugly. I think um, no worse than a stone loach, really. Um, but that is your basic burbot. So one of the key things that we get asked and one of the key things that we need to know for, for any kind of successful species conservation is how do they behave? What is their diet? What do they eat? Um, burbot are omnivores. They'll eat pretty much anything you can find in a river. They'll eat little fish like the, the trout shown down there. Um, they'll eat crayfish, which, which may be a good thing if we're talking about invasive signal crayfish. And general river life, caddisflies, snails, mayflies, um, fish fry, um, bits of detritus, um, bits of dead stuff, but, but basically anything you find on a river bed, a burbot will eat. This is particularly important in negotiating their, their potential reintroduction. There's quite a lot of fear about them um, eating trout. So the River Wissy in particular that we're looking at is a, is a trout fishery. There are two at least paid up fishing trout clubs on there. Um, the, the members are nervous about what will happen to their fish. But I think with anything, burbot will eat trout. There's no, there's no denying that. But also trout will eat burbot. I think it's just about balancing of, of the ecosystem. Um, if we have a look at what eats burbot, it's not quite, but pretty much the same list. So crayfish will eat young burbot. Trout will definitely eat young burbot. Otters, eels, other burbot. Pretty much everything. So they, they will eat, um, they will eat anglers fish, they'll eat roach as well, and anything like that at all. But equally, a, a lot of those species will will eat burbot. So in terms of whether it's gonna, gonna decimate a native species, I don't think so. Um, they've co-evolved, um, they, they coexist in, in Europe perfectly happily. So in that respect, I don't see a problem. Do they belong in Cameo? Um, yes, they absolutely do. So they are a native UK fish. They were here in, in big numbers of, of varying numbers um, from the Ice Age right through to 1969 and probably a little bit beyond. Um, the last bird that we're aware of is currently sat in the Zoology Museum in Cambridge. You can go and see it. Um, and it was caught not far from Cambridge in the Fens on the, on the Old West River there in 1969. So these are something that a lot of a lot of anglers remember catching. There are people out there that bring us their burbot memories, um, and they're, they're absolutely um, there within living memory, no doubt about that at all. The Fenland rivers and the east flowing rivers of, of 
probably middle England down to southern England with a real heartland. Um, these are the Fenland rivers here and each of the triangles represents a, a recorded Burbot capture. Um, the Trent catchment was also quite big for Burbot. We think they went there earlier. That obviously had a much bigger hit of industrial pollution following the Industrial Revolution. We think they disappeared from the Trent earlier. And we still get stories constantly. There's a guy on Twitter who keeps telling us that he knows where to catch a Burbot in the Fens. It's really easy, <laughs> but he's not telling us where. Um, and we think that, that there have been sightings from the Yorkshire rivers. They used to live in the the, the Yorkshire Esk um, and a couple of other rivers up there. Um, there, there are sightings and also in the Wissey, we, we've got a guy who's pretty sure that he's seen one, um, I think probably 15, 20 years ago, but not verified. So as far as we know, they're gone. If you look at all the Environment Agency fishing surveys that have taken place in all these rivers over the last 30, 40 years, not single burbot, not single burbot recorded in, in any academic studies, um, not a verified bird, but caught by an angler. Um, if, if they're not absolutely gone, then they're certainly functionally extinct, we think. But this really was the heartland, the, the slow flowing, deeper, complex Fenland rivers with, with lowland floodplains. Um, and ideally very, very kind of rooty, complex habitat. So yes, they belong here, native species, here till very recently. Um, and recently extinct. Just excuse me for one second, I just have to shut the door, there's going to be disturbance. Sorry, I didn't account for that when I, when I offered to step in. Um, that's the home. And why did they disappear? It's not possible to nail that down. Um, we, we think it's a combination of factors. There's no one definitive moment where the burbot went. We went from different rivers at different times. Um, and we think it's kind of a, a suite of factors, the, the usual things that, that are harming our rivers. So we think a loss of complex habitat. The, the picture on the slide there is a perfect example of what some of our some of our rivers have become. Dead straight, no trees, no fallen trees, no tree roots, uniform bed, no pools, no riffles, nowhere to hide, nowhere to spawn. And we think the loss of that complexity is really important, especially for burbot, which is a fish that uses the floodplain. Um, the use of floodplain ponds and oxbow lakes and backwaters are, and flooded areas are really important to, to burbot. Um, and we think the loss of that complexity and the kind of simplification and canalisation of our rivers is, is certainly in large part to blame. Also fragmentation of habitat. Um, they didn't just disappear overnight, they disappeared slowly, probably over the period that our rivers were becoming more and more fragmented, dams and weirs going in all over the place, um, rivers being dredged, the loss of connectivity to the floodplain. And that's a big one for a fish that needs to migrate to complete its life cycle, not just up and down the river, but also in and out of the river sideways. That loss of habitat or the fragmentation of the habitat is a real problem. And water pollution is probably a factor as well. Um, they really dived and disappeared post-war, um, which seems to be when, um, when we had the worst hits of, of nasty agricultural chemicals. Um, we're, we're not using a lot of the really unpleasant stuff anymore, but the same things that almost led to the, the complete loss of otters and, and ospreys and things. It, it was in that same period that, um, that Burbot went. I think industrial pollution, not really a problem in the Fenland rivers. Um, Population is quite sparse, so I don't think sewage works particularly, but certainly possibly um, unpleasant agricultural pollution. So what does a burbot need? Again, if, if we're serious about reintroducing a species, we need to understand its habitat requirements really, really well. Um, as I said on the previous slide, burbot need complex connected habitat. So they need fallen trees in, in rivers, they need root masses in rivers where they can get in amongst the roots, the young fish and hide and rear nursery habitat in there. Um, they need deep pools, uh, they, need, they need the meanders and oxbows at the side of the rivers and all, all this stuff that's been lost from a lot of our Fenland area. They need a good food source, which is a, a result of a healthy river. Sorry, I'll be back with you in one sec.
<laughs> oh, I really should have thought this through before I offered. Um, they need a good food source, every, everything that Healthy River provides. They need invertebrates, they need other fish species in there. But they also need cold, clean water. A burbot is a cold water fish. We're right at the southern end of its range here. Um, climate change has been suggested as a, as a possible reason for extirpation. That doesn't seem quite right. Um, they disappeared um, probably in the 70s, um, certainly in the 60s when climate change hadn't really hit home. And they're currently thriving after reintroduction in Belgium and Germany. But one of the things that makes the Whitty a good candidate is it's very strongly spring groundwater fed. That's what the picture on the left is. So you do get the constant feed of cold, of cold clean water, which they absolutely need. So can they come back? Is it possible? And can we do it? Um, we think yes. It's, it's not possible to answer this question absolutely definitively. So we cannot say if we reintroduce Berbert to the WISI or to the Cameo area that they'll definitely thrive. There's no, that you cannot give that definitive answer. But we've had quite a number now of feasibility studies, starting with a guy called Tom Worthington at the University of Southampton, working with Paul Kemp a few years ago. Um, and going on to Rewilding Britain have recently done a feasibility study, various papers published and various examples from across Europe and in North America as well, all suggesting that it's possible. Um, we've had to do some backup work for that. We've had to have temperature loggers out. Um, we're currently doing assessments of habitat connectivity just to be sure as we possibly can be that, that this has got a very strong chance of succeeding. Um, and all the signs say yes. So the temperature loggers are absolutely key. They need that cold water through the, through the spawning period. And from what we've seen, the, the WISI can provide that. Um, and the, the signs are very, very good. There's a, there's a whole lot of literature there to say, to say that this is possible. Um, and the key thing for us is we're, we're absolutely not the first people to do it. We've learned a huge amount from guys in Belgium and, and Germany where, where Burbot have been successfully reintroduced to rivers very similar to the Wissi. Um, the, the Belgian rivers in particular, um, where Burbot have been reintroduced by the Belgian government, the equivalent of, of natural England, um, they're thriving there. Um, we're we're going to have a look at some point next year, hopefully, but the rivers certainly appear to be in, in, in no better health than the Wissi. The reasons we picked the WISI in particular are um, Tom Worthington in, in his PhD and follow-up work identified that area as the most likely for a successful burbot reintroduction, partly because of the strength of the, of the cold, clear spring water feed, and partly because of the complexity of the habitat as well. The, the WISI, um, certainly the upper WISI, is still a reasonably wild place. It floods, there's tree roots, there's complexity, um, and it, it seems like everything's there for the burbot. So how far have we got? We've been working on this probably for eight years and it started as a as an idea really. Um, a guy called Carl Sayer at, at University College London who a lot of you all know just kind of suggested it to us about eight years ago when Norfolk Rivers just was fairly new that maybe this is, is something that we should be looking at. Um, and we kind of explored it for a little while and, and had initial conversations um, and really grew to think that actually it's doable and it is the right thing to do. So the first stage was to go through all that feasibility work, review what there actually was um, and bring together academic partners. So, it, so we've now got kind of academic support group who I must say don't ever agree with each other <laughs> on anything um, and don't always make the process easier, but absolutely no burbot and fishery introductions inside out. So we're working with the guys at Hull University, at UCL and hopefully seeing Essex University, um, all fish and freshwater specialists, um, some of them habitat connectivity specialists um, to, to understand the river as well as we possibly can before we do anything. Um, and to understand if the project is or isn't successful, what makes it a success or, or, or what causes it to fail. Um, as I said, we've had huge input from the Belgian, Belgian and, and German guys who've already done it. That's been a massive help. So the first probably four or five years were these discussions. 
and then engagement with the Environment Agency in Natural England who would need to license it. That's been, it's been tricky at times. Um, I think we're close to there now. Um, certainly questions within the Environment Agency Fisheries team about whether we should be reintroducing what, what is effectively a, a predator into, into a river, whether that'll work, who's gonna pay for it, how it, how it can be managed. Um, and Natural England as well, and the, the massive hurdle that we had was getting recognition that the burbot was a native UK species that needed conservation help. And we, we got that officially recognised by Natural England probably two years ago, and they've been massively on side since. <clears throat> and that's been a huge help to us. Um, and that's allowed it to get more and more real. And as it's got more, more and more real, we've, um, we've moved out and engaged with a slightly wider audience. We've been talking to the MOD about the, the River Wissy in particular. They're a, a large landowner there. Um, they've got a national conservation team who we've engaged with. Um, they've also got uh, um, the MOD Fishing Club up there, who've been very important stakeholders, actually, because they're the ones that are most likely to be directly affected by this. Um, they're fully on side. They, they, they say this is a very good thing. Um, and we've started to do things for the wider public. We had a, a webinar probably about a year ago now um, to introduce the idea. We've been kind of trickle feeding it in on social media and, and growing support for it. Um, and what that's allowed us to do, particularly the, the recognition from Natural England, is to start making a serious plan to do this. So we've got as far as, we've got a source of eggs. Um, when Tom Worthington finished his PhD, he went on to look at burbot genetics. He took genetic samples from the fish in the Cambridge Museum, the fish in the museum at um, Woolerton in, in Nottingham. All these burbot specimens that are around the country He's analysed their genetics, analysed the genetics of the European populations, to see where our closest match might come from. And actually the Belgian fish are very well matched, which makes complete sense if you consider that the Burbot range is everywhere from France and Belgium right up into the, the high Arctic lakes of Scandinavia. Um, it's much more likely that our fish will match the southern populations, and they, they totally do. So we've got a genetic match, we've got a hatchery that are prepared to provide us with eggs, that, that absolutely isn't a problem. We did have a rearing facility, so we've got to import the fish as eggs because we can, we, they'll be biosecure. If you bring them over it's, as an older life stage, it's harder to guarantee the biosecurity. But we can import them in a biosecure way. We did have a very good hatchery lined up at Eastern College. Um, unfortunately, they're having financial difficulties. Um, but we're in discussion with the Environment Agency in Natural England, um, sorry, Natural Resources Wales, about whether they're able to, to rear the fish onto a, um, a later age for us. Um, as we know from the Belgian, the Belgian work, that the bigger the fish are when they go in, the, the better return you get on them, the more spawning adults you get. Um, we have a costed plan to do this. We know roughly what it's all, what it's all going to cost. We've got a monitoring program in place, so we'll be tagging certain numbers of the burbot, um, so they're identifiable as, as stocked fish, so we can identify them in future years. Um, we've got plans to um, monitor all the floodplain habitats to see where these fish end up. We can now do that using eDNA, see where the fish go, um, and we will ultimately know that the ultimate test is whether this, they spawn successfully in the river or not. It'll take a few years for, to find that out because it takes a few years to reach maturity, but that's the ultimate goal. Uh, we also had to carry out eDNA surveys, um, which were very wisely actually recommended by Natural England, just to try and make absolutely certain that there weren't any remnant burbot populations. So we've sampled the great ooze and the witty catchment in particular, um, just looking for traces of burbot DNA using techniques that have picked up burbot in a whole load of other European coastal rivers, found absolutely nothing. Because what we didn't want was to find that we're introducing fish onto a tiny existing native population that we would have been much better to try to conserve as it is. But um, we was close to proving they're extinct as we can, we can possibly get at this moment. So what do we still need to do? The, not surprisingly to um, probably anybody, there's a, there's a huge and complex application process. So we need licenses to import the fish. We need licenses to hold and rear the fish. We need licenses to, rear, to release the fish. 
um, we need stakeholder and landowner consent and all those things come from different bodies and all those things take time to, to work through and secure. So to my mind, there's a good six months to one year of, of paperwork and negotiation still to be done there. We still need to secure and prepare that rearing facility. Um, that's been one of the most taxing things. There, there are guys at the Environment Agency who've successfully reared Burbot before at the Environment Agency facilities. Um, the same guys are keen to do it again, but they, they need permission to do that. Quite sensibly, they're worried about if they bring in a fish from Europe and that, that brings in some kind of biosecurity risk, that's a threat to their, their whole setup there. So they're, they're nervous about that and trying to see how they can possibly work around that. Um, and once we manage all that, uh, which, which actually now is seeming pretty achievable, we'd then be at the stage to import the eggs. So we'd be looking at hundreds of thousands of eggs per year rearing those onto fingerling size, so sort of five to 10 centimetre fish, um, and probably releasing fish over at least five years to give, the, to give them a real good chance of establishing a population in there. If we're able to do that, at that point the stocking stops, and for the following few years we assess whether or not the, the fish are able to, able to, to breed and thrive in the, in the Wissy and the Fenland rivers. Um, and if they're able to do so, that, that's a massive success. Um, if they're not able to do so, then we need to know why. We need to stop the stocking. That's not a sustainable way to behave. With this, this, we, we just don't want to be year after year bringing in burbot from Europe. What we're very much trying to do is, is establish them again as a, a native burbot, self-sustaining population. So the monitoring is a huge part of, of what we're doing there. And what do we want to see? So as, as well as the fish going into the river, what we really want to do is, is use this project as, as a way to kickstart even more WISI habitat restoration. Um, in particular, looking at floodplain connectivity, looking at how we can restore the old um, oxbows and backwaters and ponds where necessary, see what needs re-excavating, see whether we can lower the flood embankments or the, rather the dredging embankments to, to get the fish back onto the floodplain. Are there any weirs we can take out? Do we need to be felling more trees into the river to make this a more, a more complex natural environment? All that stuff, um, which we've been working on with the Environment Agency for, for well as long as Norfolk River's just been here, actually probably nearly 10 years. But um, we really want to use the burb as a, as a species. We can trumpet to, to push the wissy to a really healthy, quite wild place it, i think it's the one river where we've got room to do that to really use the floodplain and allow the environment to be itself and we want the that we want the burbot to be a, a flagship species in kind of the, the whole catchment restoration of the upper wissy so that's what we want to see um, you can see the wissy is, is part of the way there from the picture below it does flood out quite nicely a lot of those habitats are left hence its choice as a as a receptor site um, that's that's the end of the of the formal talk. Um, thank you very much for listening. Apologies that I had to <laughs> disappear and shut the door twice. Um, and I hope that's that's allowed James to get his presentation queued up. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jonah. That's the first thing to say is we very much appreciate you, you jumping in, um, in in there, all in good spirit of partnership working. And we have the slides from James. So thank you, James, for your patience too. Um, before we go to James, Jonah, there are a few um, questions and, and points probably for further discussions. We'd really appreciate your, um, your view on. Um, so the first sort of potential collaboration point, so Alan Woods has um, expressed an interest in um, potentially also back in the CAM headwater streams, constant cool water from the aquifer. Could there be a trial there too? Um, it's not a specific question per se, but maybe something to catch up on together after this conference um, and think about the CAM potential. Um, and then Kelvin also said um, the berber may not breed as they require under four degrees water temperature, uh, whilst rivers like the Wissy remain at moderate in terms of fish stock, um, questioning introducing other predators um, as they're not threatened internationally um, and the Wissy flow is still an issue. Um, obviously, there's a few things to pick up there um, offline, maybe, but I don't know if you want to say anything to them 
now? Yes, yeah, certainly. So um, we would be interested in, in looking at a second river. Um, we've been approached on this quite a few times from the Waveney and the, and the Yorkshire rivers and, and various other places. And it seems to make sense to me to have a second, a second site. You know, there could be a catastrophic pollution incident in the Wissy that, that destroys the whole project. So to have a second site would be would be quite sensible. We'd be interested to talk about that. Um, unfortunately for me, it's Norfolk Rivers Trust and that's outside Norfolk, but that's that's not an obstacle for the whole rest of the team. So yes, we'd be happy to talk about that. Um, the temperature issue, that was the, the absolute key concern. It is the Wissy too warm now and does that just make it a waste of time? Um, the temperature loggers suggest not that we've had them out um, for two winters um, and it's been consistently cold enough with, within the upper range of cold enough, but it has been cold enough. Um, and again, it's something we, we've looked at the literature for and, and spoken to the Belgian guys a lot about. Um, and we seem to be OK there. So that's hopeful. Um, Kelvin, I think there's an in-between question, but the predator issue... Um, Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, that's something that's, that's been raised a lot as well. Um, and as I said, Burbot will eat anything, um, just like a trout will eat anything, an eel will eat anything, <clears throat> probably more omnivorous than a pike or a perch. But um, to me, they're, they're just part of the system. Um, you know, it's a, it's a free for all in there. Everything's eating everything. They're a native species that they've co evolved with trout, um, roach, dace, pike, perch, otters, eels, herons. Um, everything else in there and I think if we build a more balanced ecosystem that that can only be good for fish populations as a whole so but I appreciate the concern for for anglers um, but also think of the opportunity of fishing for burbot and think how big your trout will get if they're suddenly fed hundreds of thousands of burbot fry so um, I hope that answers that there was, there was another bit from Kelvin I think Jesse was there. Was the third question in there? It was um, the final point in Calvin's um, comment was about also the wissy flow is still an issue. Yes, um, potentially, potentially so, and that's what we're looking at at the moment with the UCL. Actually, um, how much water there actually is there? Does it spill onto the floodplain regularly enough at the right times? So yeah, that's that's absolutely a concern and, and something that we're trying to work through at the moment. Thank you. And from Will, um, comment that it sounds like a, a, a great project and seems like the reintroduction of beavers could help create burbot habitat. Yeah, it absolutely would. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would be very, very keen to see that on the WISI. I think it would be absolutely amazing. Um, there are issues, though, with, with, again, beavers on the WISI is something we've talked about for a long time. Um, the immediate problem is the WISI leads straight down into the fens and beavers burrowing into flood embankments downstream and across the whole Fenland area is potentially a big problem. Um, so the WIS is not probably the, the easiest place to start and manage a reintroduction. Um, I'd absolutely love to see it, and I think it must be achievable, you know, if we can have, can have beavers in, in European capital cities, um, beavers in the Netherlands, beavers in Denmark, all these low-lying agricultural environments. I think it must be manageable. I don't think England is in a position to, to manage those beavers yet. The expertise isn't there. But as we're doing more and more trial reintroductions and um, enclosed reintroductions, um, I think between Rivers Trust and the Environment Agency and Natural England, that expertise will come and I'm, I'm hopeful we will get beavers in the WISI one day. Thank you, Jonah. And then um, the rest of the chat seems to be about previous talks. So we'll we'll sift through and pick up the points from that. Um, I just noticed, Anna, um, you have your hand raised. I wanted to check whether you had a question to ask Jonah or whether there was an accidental hand or um, if it's specifically for the Anglian water, please could you write it down and we'll we'll address it for you offline. Um, I'll take that as an accidental hand since I can't hear you, um, but please do write in the chat if, if we're just missing your point. Um, well, thank you very much, Jonah. A really interesting talk. And um, those were all of the questions from the room um, and really appreciate you, you jumping in there again. So thank you. Thank you.
All right, so um, unless there are any objections, um, I would propose, since we now have James' slides, to jump straight into them, it, since it is the last talk of the day, and Sam and I don't have a great Sam deal of closing talk to do. Sorry, I'm getting the echo now that James has come on, so I'm going to mute myself and show your slides. Thank you, Joe, for stepping in there. I, um, I owe you one next time I see you. Uh, 